Well, okay. I am so excited to introduce you to our guest today on the Entrepreneur Show. First of all, I tell you, my name is Heidi Richards Mooney, and I am the founder of Women in E-Commerce. It's a, an organization started in 2001, uh, and our mission is to help women do more business on and off the web. And uh, I'm also the founder and president of Redhead Marketing. And today I have the absolute honor to introduce you to Nancy Waylon Eichler, Brownie Brittle, this year's Golden Mouse Honoree for Social Media. So Nancy is a 25-year marketing veteran focusing on digital who was recently named one of South Florida's most influential businesswomen of 2015 by the South Florida Business Journal. Woohoo! Congratulations. Nancy. Thank you. That's wonderful. Nancy is most recently known for her role uh, building Brownie Brittle to be one of the fastest growing food brands in the business. She was the company's first official um, employee and now serves as vice president, global, digital, and social, and manages all customer service along with several sales accounts, including Amazon, United Airlines, and Delta. He's been involved with Brownie Griddle since before their signature product appeared on the stores in April of 2011. So welcome, Nancy, and thank you for thank being you. with us. So excited. So um, I'm going to ask you the first question. Now, I'm hearing a little feedback, so I'm going to clock uh, log out, but you stay on because you can talk in the recording. Okay, go ahead. And then I'm going to come back in. So sometimes that happens, too. So tell us first how you got involved in social media as a profession. Um, well, it kind of goes back, uh, you know, I had been with AOL for years, so digital became really a comfortable shoe for me, so to speak. Um, I, I, was, I started at AOL in 1996, and you know, um, social, while we think of it as new, if you go back to the old days of chat rooms, back in, um, you know, when AOL really kind of surged um, to the head of the class as, as a digital player. Um, social media, that, that was social media. You know, I remember they created these buttons called instant messaging buttons, and um, they, they had little icons on them, and they expected that kids would really love these icons. And what we found was that it, um, adults were as attracted to you know, having a turtle represent yourself or, you know, a, a little horse or, you know, um, maybe a character of some sort represent you. And when you were instant messaging with friends and, you know, take that up a notch to, you know, then texting really started to get hold. Um, and, and so I think that it was really kind of a natural evolution for my role. And what I found was that um, when I began working with Brownie Brittle, we were really looking for an opportunity for growth. And social just, what we knew we needed was word of mouth. And th there's nothing better. So, um, you know, as, as I often say that, I think a lot of people will reference digital and say that it levels the playing field for the startup. And I actually happen to believe that it in fact tilts the playing field in favor of the startup because you can be more nimble. You can make some mistakes, and um, you know if you if you happen to you know screw up a text, you know whether it's a misspelling or something like that, the uh, audience is far more forgiving with a startup than they are with a seasoned brand. You know they've come to have certain expectations. If they take that snapshot of, you know, a seasoned brand making and, you know, screwing up something um, that, you know, that just uh, goes viral very quickly. With a startup, um, what I found was social was this audience that became our cheerleading base and could just catapult us um, well above and beyond where we had been um, prior to the brand launching. And, and, you know, even, even if you look at hashtag Brownie Brittle, the very first mention of the hashtag is the very first trade show we participated in referencing our product. And it's really neat to see that, to actually see that from when Twitter launched, which I think was 2006, 
up to 2011, January 2011 was when we first debuted the product in its current packaging. Um, and when we did that, there was there were a couple mentions at that trade show using that hashtag referencing our brand. And, you know, so to see that and then measure from 2011 and the just slow, slow growth that we kind of experienced. And now, you know, if you look at hashtag brownie brittle on a daily basis, the numbers are, are significant. And um, so that's been fun. But it, it all seemed to have started, I think, back with really a natural progression of the industry and seizing an opportunity. So what great examples, especially for those of you who don't know who, what AOL is. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's like asking my kid a couple years ago, I said something about a phone book and he was 10 at the time and he said, what's a phone book? Wow. Right. <laughs> my grandchildren have no idea what AOL is. My children do, though. So, um, so tell us how you you came to work for and with Brownie the Brownie Brittle brand. Well, um, I I have an interesting path. Um, I actually, my husband and I took an opportunity. Um, we both had had worked at AOL, and my husband was making cell phone games after leaving AOL, and. Wow. He and, and we took an opportunity to work with things other than zeros and ones. And we moved to the Turks and Caicos Islands. And we had two children at the time. Uh, not much after we were moving down there, um, I was pregnant with number three. So we moved down to Grand Turk in the Turks and Caicos. And my husband worked with a conch farm, helping them to expand their operations and raise funds. Carnival Cruise Lines was expanding and opening a, uh, a center there on Grand Turk. So we went down there before it was open and the Kong Farm was one of the destinations. So, you know, then, then we ultimately, that kind of led to our path to locating in South Florida. And at that time I became a full-time mom and decided that, okay, when we move permanently back to, to the States and to Florida, I decided that uh, it was time to, you know, hang up a shingle again and wanting to, to enter the workforce. Well, you know, it's interesting, Heidi, that a 40-something-year-old female who does, isn't coming from a full-time job couldn't get hired so easily. So um, anyhow, I, I, you know, but I, but I loved the digital space and, you know, South Florida at that time, there, there wasn't really as, as thriving a community for digital as there is now. And so I just started to network with people. And one of the folks that I called on, I had read an article about her was Sheila G. Maines. And I read about Brownie Brittle and I called her up and I gave her a little of my background. She was interested in building a website, launching her position online, getting her brand out there. She had had Brownie Brittle in, um, in containers, in plastic trays that you find in the bakery. And she just had not, it, it hadn't quite stuck. And I think if you read her story, her story, and by the way, is somebody you ought to have on this show. She's phenomenal. So, um, you, you'll arrange yeah, we'll, so we'll set that up. Um, but but okay. Sheila is, you know, her journey is tremendous. And meeting her and her story, she had been a 40-something-year-old woman who found herself in the unemployment line and, you know, brought herself up. I think her, hers is a story of, um, you know, just uh, tenacity, really, and never giving up. And despite being, you know, getting sand thrown in her face repeatedly from a variety of um, angles. You know, she kept coming back and kept coming back. Well, she had this product, Brownie Brittle, and she had, you know, this this concept of Brownie Brittle and the idea of really it expanding. And the, and the way to help it expand was to extend its shelf life. And the, the little plastic trays, um, which often you find takeout, you might get takeout food in if you know what I'm talking about, and so she wanted to go to something a more formal package, which um, I guess, if, and I actually have. So the stand up, the stand up yeah. pouch uh, was what she wanted to direct toward. 
And in order to extend that shelf life and really had it be part of the grocery store shelving. Well, she also was in the brownie business. And in 2008, the economy took a nosedive and her brownies were carried at right. Disney and a variety of restaurants and, and food service locations. If you were going out to dinner back in 2008, 2009, you certainly weren't ordering dessert, right? Could, could you even afford to go to a theme park, right? So Disney, you know, the, the brownies weren't selling like they had been. And so business started kind of falling off for her. That became her jumping off opportunity. You know, they say a lot of times in an economic crisis is when, you know, people come out of the woodwork with ideas and entrepreneurs are born and more out of necessity, right? Than out of, uh, sometimes than out of desire. Well, in her case, I think it was a combination of desire and necessity. Uh, she had had this concept for so long. So she and I, I had read this article about her, called her up, told her my background, and we began sitting down and talking at you know the world's greatest um, office, Starbucks, and, you know, met there regularly until we, we got to a point that we decided, yeah, we really wanted to work together. And so it was just the two of us working each from our respective households um, until, I think it was 2012. Uh, and I, it was either July or August of 2012 that I became the first full-time employee. So, yeah. That's, that's wonderful. What a great story. And yes, I do. I would love to have Sheila on the show. I met her a few years ago at a actual 50th wedding anniversary of a mutual friend that you also know. And um, uh, she would, her and her husband were just fascinating and she was just starting in business and he had just retired. So it was kind of an interesting um, combination. And he was helping her, of course, in marketing and stuff. And it was, it was kind of interesting that, and I, we really enjoyed, my husband and I enjoyed sitting with them and I, so I kind of kept in touch with her. And then when I met you, I was like, oh, my gosh, you're the one I need to talk to because you're doing exactly what we do. And in fact, I, I'm going to ask you publicly. You don't have to say yes or no now, but I would love to have you come speak to our uh, uh, the of women's e-commerce at some time. You know, I do anything for you, Heidi. Oh, oh, excellent. You're on, you're on the recording. That you're you're out now. So I'm, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> so, so what are some of the first tap, steps that you took to help make Brownie Brittle a nationally recognized brand? In other words, what types of promotions did you run early on, and how did they do they compare to what you're doing? Today um, you know, well, one of the uh, the very, I think, a major thing that uh, that uh, startups should look for is partners who, uh, I guess, I call it partnering up. You're looking for opportunities to partner with people who might have a larger audience than you might have a different audience than you. Um, something about them might be a little bit more, um, you know, th th that, uh, that you, you know, you're stepping into bigger shoes. So in our case, that's really, I, I you know, and it's, I, I guess to some degree, I don't, I don't really like this term, but I kind of trolled for fans. Um, as well online. So, you know, I would go out and look for people who had gift basket companies um, and, and were doing promotions themselves and ask them if we could send them product for their gift baskets um, and that, you know, the, be part of their giveaways. So giveaways were part of our strategy initially. It was looking for, uh, there's a, a, a woman, uh, Michelle Petrillo, with a company called Baskets and Beyond, and she used to do a lot of Facebook giveaways, and she had a tremendous number of followers. Uh, well, we we began doing giveaways with her, and you know, at that time, well, whether it's a perceived organic like, I, I don't think it is. But um, what we found was that our brand is a really easy brand to like. So you know, chocolate. How, how, how difficult is that to sell? Uh, the, the problem was that nobody understood what it was. So we had to be very descriptive with it. But in reaching out to each of the folks that we partnered with, when we were doing these giveaways, 
was really trying to help them help their audience understand who we were and what we were and what we were about. Now, at that time, we really were only available online. You know, we had limited distribution. We were in April 2011 was when we really hit our first store shelf. So January of 2011 was when we launched the website and began that social march. But it started with friends and family. And it started with really trying to engage an audience. And what I found was so critical for me, so I, I, I mentioned the partnering up, it was looking for those opportunities with these partners um, to, to grab an audience, and not just any audience. I mean, I wanted them to be, so a gift basket company had an audience that obviously liked gift baskets, gift giving, and probably food, because plenty of gift baskets are filled with food. So there were similarities. You know, we would look to chocolate companies. We would look to uh, grocery stores. We would look to uh, farm markets. Uh, we would look to any sort of influencer we could find. Bloggers became a very, very big force in our movement. Uh, female foodie bloggers we would reach out to. Of course, we had an easy product to send to them and ask them to review. Uh, Baby Center very early on reviewed our product. And with each of these, we knew that it was beneficial for SEO, and we knew that it was beneficial if we could get those consumers, the brands and the consumers, beginning to follow us on social. And not just following us, because you know, my world of follow um, doesn't really amount to much. It's a number. It was engaging them. And, and you know, what we did with that is... I, I feel very, very strongly, and I think I, I haven't heard a lot of brands. Early on, I didn't hear a lot of brands talk about it, but I do now. Uh, I think there was a gentleman from Coca-Cola that I heard him quote. It was something less than 5% of brands actually did this, um, and it's my you know one of my big secrets, and that is that you know, it's sort of, if somebody, if you have a retail store, and that's the way you should think about your social presence is sort of a retail storefront. If you have a retail store and somebody comes into your retail store and says, oh my gosh, I love this store. As a store owner standing there, are you going to turn around? Are you going to, you know, do you not acknowledge them? Do you not thank them? Are you, so the idea is not, you know, sometimes, I mean, a thumbs up sometimes works, you know, a like, those kinds of things. That's at minimum, those are the things you should do. But really, to, to get that consumer to want you to succeed and to spread that word of mouth, they need to feel vested in your brand. And the only way they're going to feel vested in your brand is if they have a relationship with your brand. You know, you need to listen to them so that they will go out and, you know, share, um, you know, all about you. And that's... And that's so true. You've made some great points. So, so, and what? So, what do you do today differently than um, you did then? You know, for me, the uh, one of the things uh, well, I will say it's become far more overwhelming today than it was early on. You know, if you had a couple people responding to you, or if we had a couple people responding to us, you know, back in April two thousand eleven. It, 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 I think my one of my brothers was probably our greatest follower. You know, he, you know, he was commenting on every single post. He was, you know, but then suddenly you start to see, well, there are names that I don't recognize who are actually on here. So whether they're friends of his or friends of friends of his, and, but um, you know, and I think that today it, it has become a little more challenging because people have become better. I think that you know you you also deal with uh, the the you know when, when the marketplace has changed so much you know digital is just so rapidly evolving um, that it you know it's almost like a, a hockey stick right that it just keeps it, so yeah. rules of yesterday don't apply today so you, you kind of have to keep watching but i think the one rule that hasn't changed over time is listening to your audience and i'll give you an example that even just recently um a couple weeks ago we did 
uh, well, I would say two, a year and a half to two years ago, we were planning on changing our packaging. We went to our audience and asked them to select what packaging they wanted us to go with. And that's what we went with. You know, even Sheila can tell you that that was not what she originally would have chosen. In fact, she didn't even know that she wanted to change the packaging. But if she changed it, she didn't want it to be so dramatic. But we went to the audience and after hearing their overwhelming feedback, she felt much more comfortable about it and went with them. And now in hindsight, we'll tell you that it was a fantastic decision. Now, in the case of, you know, just recently, we're going out to our audience and asking them what, what are the problems they're experiencing with the product and what would they like us to change? And the importance to us of continually reaching out and reaching out and engaging with them. And because no, listen, a product, the, the influencers of today are, you know, all the people watching, they're all the people on social, they're the, the average consumers of yesterday are the influencers of today. And while, you know, celebrities and, um, you know, they're, they're kind of flash in the pan celebrities, um, they still have certainly tremendous influence, but you know, I, I, the food bloggers, when they embrace us, when we reach out to them, they are such a phenomenal voice for us to get feedback on, you know, flavor combinations that work, looking at trends that are happening. And from a research perspective to have gotten as many responses to our survey within a week to two weeks time versus if you wound the clock back a couple of years, I don't know how long it would have taken us to get that kind of a response. So, you know, we're, we are working these relationships. It is rapidly changing. Um, we're trying to adapt with those changes. We also have people constantly chasing after us because as a brand who, you know, is, is experiencing great success, other brands are knocking us off and, and um, producing a very similar product or attempting to produce a very similar product. So we have to list that the audience, I think is really a big part of helping direct us and support us. And, you know, when we've had negative things, negative postings online, many times I haven't even had to respond to them because our audience has done that for us. You know, a great example is when you know, a political thing when we launched in Cracker Barrel. And, you know, there was some backlash um, related to, to uh, gay rights. And, you know, we, we are a very philanthropic company. And through this philanthropy, you can see many of the organizations we've donated to. And so it was interesting to hear when we first mentioned that we had launched in Cracker Barrel and were now available nationwide, which was a really big deal for us um, because many consumers, unless you were, I, I, I think you could purchase online and you could purchase at select Costco's, but not all of them. And I think that, you know, Cracker Barrel was a little more widespread and accessible. So that was big news. And we thought it was a, a good thing. So to have within a few I'd say uh, maybe an hour or two after announcing it to have started to see some of the negativity. Um, it was our own audience that jumped in and said, you don't know who they, you don't know who they support. Find out who they support before you, you know, jump on them. Because if they had, they would have been excited that we were in Cracker Barrel, you know, political or not. But you know, it, it wasn't a political statement for us. It was just, expanding our product. It was interesting how that quickly came up and became part of the dialogue and we had to address it. But, um, you know, it was our audience who really supported us and um, went to bat for us. And, uh, you know, and, and that's something that, uh, you know, I think has been a huge learning for us was, was understanding how, you know, they can, they can jump in and be against you and jump, and, you know, uh, or support you. So I think the more engaged your followers, the more open you are as a brand. You know, for us, we're, we've been a very transparent brand, you know. 
um, that that helped us in uh, in in getting that following and 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 in getting through some of the changes that we've experienced on social. Well, and you mentioned so many great points there. First of all, you talked about uh, collaborating. You talked about you know being in stores and how you change your model from being online, and and you talked about surveys, which I think I wonder how many companies don't do that or don't do it well. By by that I say the fact that you actually took the advice of the people when you asked them for it is huge because I've seen companies who have asked. Um, their constituency, their following, their audience, whatever you want to call it, for feedback. And then they turn around and they listen to their, their, you know, maybe it's their board of advisors or their marketing team or whoever it is, and they end up not doing what the people want. And then they wonder why company, their business is falling off. I mean, I guess the fact that you're a brand, a, a product as opposed to a service, I'm not sure if it makes that much difference. I think, I think either way, the rules should be the same. But one thing you mentioned that I'd like to, a couple things. First of all, about people knocking you off. Well, that is that is the cost of the, of success. We all know that. The minute you become successful and people see how popular you are, everybody wants to steal your idea, whether it be, you know, stealing the, you know, the, the idea behind it or the, the maybe not the formula because obviously they don't have the exact formula. And I would never buy anything other than Brownie Brittle. I don't even know of any others, nor would I mention that if I did. But it's kind of like the whole Kleenex thing. You know, people buy Kleenex, but they're not really buying the brand Kleenex. That started as a brand and now became a household name. Same thing with Band-Aids. So Brownie Brittle will be a household name someday. It will be a common word, but people may be buying a different brand. And that's that's good and that's bad. But for now, you're positioned to where you are still Brownie Brittle. Nobody else can call themselves that. And hopefully, you know, you'll be... Um, yeah, I know you're a multi-million dollar company now, but hopefully at that point it won't matter that much because then it'll be, wow, I was the one who started it all. So um, I'm excited for you about that. Um, and I wanted to ask you, uh, since you uh, you talked about um, the social brand campaigns and how you did them and how you do them today, what advice would you give to uh, to a company that was starting their social media brand campaign today? Uh, the, the first thing I would say is don't spread yourself too thin. I would suggest to pick, you know, one or two of the uh, social platforms to explore with before jumping. I mean, grab, definitely grab the names that you want on every platform you can imagine um, and beyond. I think that every time I hear about a new platform, we try to at least grab our name. And then we sit back and watch before we jump in. We want to understand the landscape a little bit. I think that um, what companies do, they I think they mistake um, that needing to be present. Um, you know that that if, if Facebook, I'd say the ones that are most commonly coming up when I'm asked are Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. Depending on the type of product you have, with many food products, Instagram. Um, yeah, or anything that with, with photographs, I guess all of them, but, but Instagram is, is really big and Pinterest are really big. Um, so I would suggest that, you know, walk before you run. So start with the one that you think probably has the bulk of your audience represented. So if it's, you know, a female demographic that skews slightly older then Facebook is, is great. You know, if it's a, um, you know, a much younger demographic, a, uh, you know, a teenage demographic, you know, Instagram, if you want to explore Snapchat, um, I, you know, we, we also think, you know, in the, in the food industry, we have to think about things like uh, you know, when we consider gluten free, right? Do, you know, just because a lot of people talk about it doesn't mean that it's going to benefit your business yet to be there. So, you know, if you hear a lot of people talking about a social platform, I would say watch it. First be the observer and then begin to step in. And, and once you have a little bit of experience with one or two of those platforms and you start to understand what your audience is doing and how your audience is growing, you know, there are simple tools 
and uh, that, you know, for, for, well, to publish on multiple platforms at one time with the same image, with the same messaging. And you can do that. There is definitely a, a, a difference among the audiences, for sure. I'm sure you find that, Heidi. Um, they're they're, they're oh, yeah. very, very different. So really understanding, and that's, you know, at that engagement level, um, that's how you can become more engaged with your audience is by sticking to just one or two platforms initially, find out what they're about, understand it. If, if you aren't familiar with the platform, really, you know, put your own account on there, put a personal account on there. You know, I did that with Ello to try to understand before, you know, really doing anything and thinking because there was so much media hype about it um, and wondering that as a brand, should I be there? Shouldn't I be there? So I just waited and I just observed. And ultimately, we really didn't do anything with it because of the type of platform it was, you know. Um, but Instagram, we did. We moved We moved on to Instagram. It was our last. And you can actually, I think Pinterest might have been after Instagram. And you can see how we developed them, that the bulk of our audience, we focused on Facebook. And guess what? That's where a huge percentage of our audience is and a very engaged following. And next was Twitter. And you'll see that our numbers reflect that. But we're okay with that. We don't need mass numbers in, you know, in the wrong places. So um, Facebook worked right. really, really well for us, was a, a, a hugely popular platform for us and worked in terms of spreading our brand name. So that's probably what I would recommend. And, and that's great advice. I think most people will want to just jump into all of them. And then that's a huge mistake. And I agree. I, I Every time a new platform comes out, I at least go and yeah. get my name. And I think about it. I don't even play on some of them. I, I'm still not even on Instagram. I find I, I let my grandchildren play on it, my children. But I just thought, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't have the time for it. Plus, I'm not a real big cell yeah. phone person. I'm on my computer. So for me, Instagram is not ideal and probably my demographic as well. Um, so I would say that you're absolutely right. You need to understand and know where your audience is, number one. And then you need to be where that audience is, number two. And then and you need to understand it. So absolutely, when I coach any of my clients, I say, look, I can I can brand all five of the, the top five, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, and Pinterest. That, that's what I call the top five. If you want, I'll do Instagram for you too. But the, the fact is, you need to pick one and really become Right. dominant on it. Right. And work on it. You know, I think yeah. um, um, I think you mentioned Guy Kawasaki before. I, 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 I remember, you know, one of his pieces of advice was that oftentimes we end up, um, you know, we, we will focus our time on our weaknesses rather than our strengths. So he uses the example of Tiger Woods, who, you know, was, was um, you know, with his strength was not putting. And he was, you know, when you consume yourself with your weakness, I, I will tell my kids this too. If, if, if math is a weakness, while you can't keep it from tearing you down, you know, focus on your strengths in these cases. So, um, which is something that I remember him saying years ago. And, you know, so it, it still comes up a lot today. But, yeah, I have I, I remember somebody at a um, at an event I went to about a year ago uh, asking how could she build her Facebook following. And she was a part of a bank. And I said, you know, I, how are you on LinkedIn? And she kind of sat back and didn't understand. Well, she was personally on Facebook, which is why she wanted to build it for her business. And when we circled back around, I said, it seems like maybe if you really look at where your audience is for what you're trying to do, Facebook isn't as strong. So I would, you know, focus on LinkedIn first and then turn your attention to Facebook once you really, you know, have, have nailed that. And you know what? That's other really great advice. 
as you said, focusing on the, the site where your audience is. I think it's the site where your audience is most likely to take action. Because if you think about it, probably a lot of the people that are on LinkedIn are also right. on Facebook, but they're used Facebook Agreed. differently. Whereas and they, they expect, like I'm, I'm a service business. My Most of my audience, because I do social media, I found that the most the buying audience is mostly on LinkedIn. However, I've got the same clients also on Facebook. So you're absolutely right. So here's a question I have for you. What's your favorite social media site for branding and promoting a company? And I guess your exa- your person your example it would be great. And then also what's your favorite personal? Well, for me, um, you know, I would say for for our company has been Facebook. Um, by far has been Facebook. Uh, it was it was very, very easy early on. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we did, we used Facebook ads um, probably about a year and a half into having a Facebook site. We began using Facebook ads and they had they, they no longer do these ads, but we loved them at the time. And I'll tell you, they were like gold. Uh, I believe, if, you know, in the friend referral world, Facebook had an ad where, you know, you could market to the friends of your brand, you know, friends of people who liked, or I should say friends of the people who liked your brand. So, you know, if, if, you know, your sister um, is a friend of yours on Facebook and you liked Brownie Brittle, then, you know, I could have an ad that appeared on her Facebook page that says Heidi Richards Mooney likes Brownie Brittle. Do you want to like Brownie Brittle too? And what I found, it was very, very simple for us, was testing graphics. Um, we found that that was the easiest word of mouth that we, and, and cheapest word of mouth that we could get out there. I mean, we, we were gaining fans by the thousands with that ad cam- those ad campaigns for pennies. Um, and, but the ironic thing was because they weren't just random targets, because they were friends of people who already liked the brand, what we found was that the the uh, the folks who were liking us were a very engaged audience because they felt like they had gotten a referral. You know, it's as if they had walked down the street, run into you, and you had said, "Oh my gosh, you got you have to try the latest snack. I love it." And so. That became a tremendous asset for us in growing our audience base. Um, and for me personally, uh, I would say certainly f- Facebook is up there, um, but I, I really I like Instagram. And the reason I like it, it's funny, you know, I, I, I'm so fascinated by it, maybe because I have kids and watching their interaction. And, you know, I have a son who is now 13 and he's just been allowed an Instagram account. So watching that and observing. So I think that as a, uh, a social media fan, a lot of times I'm first the observer before I am the participant. And uh, so I, I do find um, Instagram really fascinating to me, what, what people post, how they communicate with each other, because it does, in some regards it is a complete different language. You know, it is. And I've, I've actually gone on with my granddaughter and I just, I do love it. I just find that it's, for me, it's just one more thing that I don't need to learn right now. I have an account, yes. but I've never used it. I think I've posted two pictures on my Instagram account. And, and I guess maybe someday, you know, I, I'm an early adopter for some things like Pinterest. I was on there way early and, and Twitter too. I was within the first million people. Um, and I say that because they were, it took them two years to get to a million. Whereas now, like for instance, a uh, blab. It took less than um, uh, I think they had ten million within five months or some ridiculous number like that. So you know the mo- world is per- certainly moving a lot faster. Um, so uh, if you had just one tip or one resource that you could share with us today, what would that be? Uh, you know, I think I said it early on. I, I and and it seems fairly basic. And I want to refer to a website and I want to refer to a tool. But I'm going to tell you, we were all born with them, and that, those are ears. You know, I, I really am such an advocate of, of, of listening 
um, to, to your audience of communicating with people, of seeing what, you know, I'm a, a big fan of testing things and see what happens because, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there, there, are, and there are plenty of tools out there to help you with listening. You know, for me, I use um, mention a lot, uh, which, you know, t to keep me up to date with, you know, what my audience is saying and make sure that I'm posting when I need to post. post. You know, I've used tools like Hootsuite as well. Um, but it's, it's really, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm a hands-on person. I don't have other people that I'm having, you know, post these messages. I'm reading them because that's also something else. We're big believers. It's, it's interesting. I've met with, um, with Sheila recently again. And for, I think when we first launched social, Sheila's reaction was, it's okay if, you know, eventually, Nancy, we'll get to the point where we'll hire some people and you're thinking, you know, a, a younger, maybe just out of college um, student, maybe an intern who can manage this social thing for us. And what we found was it was, it was almost too important to not make sure that the brand voice was properly represented because you know, we did have an agency that did some work for us. And while they were excellent with many things they did, um, they, they, they weren't internal. Um, so, and, and they didn't have the knowledge we do. They didn't have the finesse with customer service. I think that, uh, you know, I'll use the example of, I know Groupon uses sometimes uh, uh, improv comedians to help write some of their works and to work with their customer service team. And I think that's brilliant because if you think about improv, the one rule in improv is never disagree. You always have to be accepting. So if, you're, if your customer says your product is lousy and why do you use such and such ingredient, you can't just close them off. You have to listen to what they're saying. You know, do they have, is there some validity behind there? You may find out there isn't, but if there is, are there other people who are saying that? You know, is there, you know, our audience is the very audience that has told us about every single knockoff product that's out there. They've told us about knockoff products that are in other countries. Um, they've told us about the inability to find our product. Our audience was the, the, the first, they were, uh, we found out that our, our product had been taken out of Costco Midwest for a little while because they were doing a, a, a seasonal rotation. And our audience began asking us, you know, what, what happened? Where are you guys? I can't find you. Come back. Come back. And we then turned and went to the broker. The broker came back and said, yes, in fact, you're not there right now because they're bringing you back in, in, I don't know, it was like in, in two or three months. Well, we then went back out to this audience and said, hey, can you help us get back on the shelves sooner? And there was a gentleman I remember um, who is an attorney who took it upon himself to help start a letter writing campaign with many other members. And wow. within two weeks, of us having said, hey, help us get back out there, we got a contact back from Costco saying, we're bringing you back in sooner. How quickly can we get your product? So uh, that's that's why I say, really, listen, listen, listen. If there are tools, like I mentioned, where you can track what your audience is saying, but, but you really have to pay attention. I mean, you, you want to have fun with them. You want to focus, you know, you want to spend time on communicating fun things back to them. Like, you know, if somebody says, I love you, Brownie Brittle, and, and I write, I, I love you back. And, you know, it's, it's funny, but I also want to hear, I, I really listen to the people who complain. And I really listen to the people who have thoughtful conversations with us to tell me what's happening, you know, what they like, what they don't like, you know, where they'd like us to be, 
um, uh, new products they'd like us to come out with, things they'd like to see um, more of, less of. That's great, but you know what, great advice. I mean, listening is such an underused skill and such an important part of every person's business, no matter what type of business you're in. So I, I just love that. What a great, uh, thank you very much. And love that story about the, 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 that is the power really truly of social media and especially the way you have built your, what I call raving fans. And so does, I think it's Peter Drucker, whoever wrote the book. I don't remember if it was Peter Drucker. Someone wrote the book, Raving Fans. Um, and it was just, uh, if you ever read that book, it talks a lot about how you build that base and you've done every single thing right to do it. And, you know, I'm sure like every company, we make mistakes along the way, but you've done the things that you've done, the things that have made you the success you are. And so thank, thank you for that, because I'm so glad that, you know, look, um, I should probably not eat as much of it as I do, <laughs> but I love it. And uh, I can't even imagine anything wrong with it. Forget that it's not gluten-free. I don't even care, you know. Um, and my kid, I have a, I have a child who eats mostly no gluten, but when she got the brownie brittle after the the, the woman's con the, the Golden Mouse Award, she told me, she goes, I have to get it out of the house. I ate a bag within a day. I'm like, okay. So that's a great testimony. It is just you. such a wonderful well, plan. Credit to Sheila. Credit to Sheila. Sheila, it is all her baby, you know. Yeah. I was going to say, tell Sheila, thank you for being the, the inventor of this amazing, amazing. Uh, I don't think it's food. It's yeah. more like heaven. It's a treat. So thank you for that. What's next for Brown? Well, Brown? we just released four new flavors. One is peanut butter. And then we have three holiday flavors. Uh, those flavors are available online. All flavors are available online at uh, browniebrittle.com. And they're also available in select retail stores. If you go on our website, you can find retail stores carrying brownie brittle. Unfortunately, you won't be able to know what all flavors are carried at, at which stores. I believe Target has the holiday flavors. Uh, the three holiday flavors are chocolate chip with a white snowflake drizzle, which is like a white chocolate drizzle. And then we have salted caramel with a dark drizzle, which is a dark chocolate drizzle. And then mint chocolate chip with a uh, dark drizzle also. So those, what we've done is we've basically dressed up three flavors for the holidays with this little extra drizzle touch, which is so delicious. And just, just a little more indulgence, just a couple more calories. So without, <laughs> without breaking the bank. So that's what's next for us. We are also working on an organic product right now which is due out um, uh, this late fall, early winter. And um, you'll have to sign up for our newsletter to find out exactly where it's being released first. But um, so the organic version, and then of course we keep tweaking this Blondie Brittle. We're begging for that thing to come out. So we've uh, played with a Blondie Brittle flavor for a while and um, Every time I taste it, I just love it. But, you know, one great thing about Sheila is she is an absolute perfectionist with her flavors. And, you know, just it, 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 if, if it isn't perfect, it's not going out. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're close, but we're not quite there on Blondie Brittle. So those are the next things up for us. And your fans are going to love it. So tell us how we can get in. What's the best way to connect with you? And, of course, I've, I've already typed in browniebrittle.com, but any other websites or social media you'd like to mention, go ahead okay. and say it. And then well, on all social, we're at then Brownie then Brittle. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, we're at Brownie Brittle. And then for myself, I'm at Nancy Eichler on Twitter and Instagram. And then on Facebook, Nancy at Nancy Whalen Eichler. Excellent. Nancy Eichler and Brownie Brittle. Excellent. So Nancy, thank you so much for being with us today. You know, we've run out of time, but I tried to make sure I got in those really important questions. I so appreciate it, you. And again, congratulations on all your recent um, uh, accolades, the Golden Mouse Award, the South Florida Business Journal Award. I, I just, I, I'm thrilled that we crossed paths a few months ago and that now we're in each other's circles. Thank so you. thank you for being with what us. What a lot of fun.
despite you know starting off with a uh, with a um, a flu over the weekend and technical problems, we managed to work it out. We did, and you did great. I just wanted to mention the next show, which is um, Friday, November thirteenth. Our our guest that day is Felicia Hatcher, and if you don't know her, she's chief popsicle for feverish ice cream and gourmet pops. Amazing woman. She's gotten all kinds of awards like Nancy White House has given her a CEO of the year award. And she's just, I can't wait. She's also a past Golden Mouse Award recipient last year. So uh, we're real excited to interview her on Friday. And of course, uh, I'm Heidi Richards with uh, Women in E-Commerce, WECAI.org and Redhead Marketing E. And it has been my Real honor to interview Nancy Eichler from Brownie Brittle today. Thank you, Nancy. And have Thanks, a Heidi. Afternoon. You too. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Right. I'm just going to go ahead and type in um, the couple of the websites. And I didn't, I, since I haven't stopped the recording, I'll also mention that um, if you'd like to read about some of these amazing women, you can go to our website, www.entrepreneurs, P-R-E-N-E-N-T-R-E-P-R-E-N-H-E-R-S.com, and you can read about all the upcoming and the